Thank you for watching or listening to the Plant Your Seeds of Transformation podcast. I am your host, coach and author, Donna Marie. And I'm so blessed and honored to have one of my favorite people, (laughs) Venice Johnson here with us today. Venice is a coach with a vision and a voice that resonates with me. And I am so honored that she agreed to come and share with this audience. Welcome, Venice. How are you doing today? I am fantastic, Donna. Thank you so much for having me here. It's like Christmas. I've been looking forward to having this conversation with you. I've been so excited. Ever since I heard you on uh, Stephanie Callahan's um, uh, video, I just was like, this woman is like perfect for our audience. Um, I I just feel that everything that I've um, uh, heard from you, witnessed of you so far, lean towards helping Black women leaders. And so tell us more about who you are, what you do, who you serve. Thank you. So I am known as the boldness coach. So that is the word boldness. And I help women to be bold, big, and bad and live a life of no permission needed. And what that really translates to is helping women to develop the courage so they can take a stance for themselves in the space of the, in the journey of life where they are now. So that's what I do. And I help women um, from ages of in the 40s up to mid 60s, because what I've experienced on my own, as well as the women that I work with with experience, is life transitions seem to be magnified during this time period. Mm -hmm. So we're getting to the asking ourselves a question of, is this the career that, you know, I want to be in? You know, am I doing the type of work that I see myself doing? Is it impacting the world? Is it in alignment with the value system that I have for myself? This is the, that time period is when women start to ask about the relationships around them. You know, do I have a support system? Um, you know, do I have more takers than givers? Am I mm-hmm. overgiving and not receiving back? You know, it's also an, a, a, an opportunity in a space where women start to think about what do I want my life to look like going forward? If my life has not, um, is it not, if it's not reflecting back to me in this moment of what I see within myself or the embodiment of who I see that I am, then it is time for me to step up and really to go inward, to get into self-reflection, get into self-awareness, to also get into a place of self-truth so that you can then be able to come out and say, all right, I've got the, I've got the skinny, I've got the inside. So now I can decide how I want to play in life going forward. Love it, love it, love what you do, love how you serve. I, I've heard, I heard in there that you help women kind of um, find themselves. Am I hearing that right? You're hearing that absolutely right. And as women, you know, we go through, wow, quite a bit on the journeys, you know, in our lives and different cycles in our lives. I mean, you know, we, we take on and wear a lot of titles, you know, and we take on a lot of roles. And when we do that, you know, Rightfully so, because they, those roles and or titles may be appropriate, you know, for that time period in our lives. But what happens, Donna, is we get to a point to where we need to disrobe <laughs> from the roles and the titles. Because if you are a caregiver, that loved one eventually may get their wings. Um, if you are a mom, eventually your children will grow up and leave the house and become an empty nested, you know. Um, you also may outgrow who you used to be. And you are really trying to get clear about, you know, who you need to be. My therapist told me a really great question um, that I think a really great comment one time. And as I was going through therapy, you know, on this journey, right, of trying to figure out, 
you know, who, who do I need to be? He said, you know, the woman you used to be, but you don't know the woman who you need to be. And I was so busy trying to operate from who I used to be into the current life and using that to springboard into the next. And it wasn't fitting, wasn't fitting. So frustration sets in, disappointment sets in, disillusion sets in, um, you know, anxiety sets in, just all, all kinds of isms, you know, develop and illnesses develop when we're not true to who we are and who God designed us to be. Do you find that many times women who are a little older compare themselves now with themselves in the past? And what does that do to them when they do that? Absolutely. I mean, here, here's the, the thing about the culture. The culture we live in as a whole you know, and especially the influences in our culture, you know, inadvertently put us into mental spaces, you know, of our younger selves. So whether that's always putting youth in front of us <laughs> and, and not allowing us to embrace the, the life lessons and the wisdom that we've learned. So, you know, you may want to do that, but the culture, and if, you're, if you really don't draw the line and recognize there's a line between you and them, then what happens is you will try to replicate in your present life who you used to be. But here's the reality. In my present life, I was younger. You know, I had more energy. <laughs> I didn't have some of the, the physiological changes that are happening in my body when you get in the 50 plus club. Um, I also didn't have the depth of knowledge of, about ex, from experiences. So, you know, I thank God that today that I was able to have my life spared to be here because sometimes I just made choices on the whim. And then also what I see is a lot of women try to compare their ability and their agility to who they used to be. I have a friend that used to say to me, you know, when I was in my 30s, I used to be on top of things. And, you know, I remember my son saying to me, mom, you used to always be on top when, you know, when the latest and newest technology came out, mom. And I'm surprised that you, you know, that you're lagging and asking me these questions. And then we start to repeat that story in our head. And then we make that story a reality for us because we start to approach whatever the task is at hand, and we bring that story to the task. And when we bring that story to the task, then we are trying to use, you know, the same ability, you know, and agility to respond to a past story and a, and a past, um, well, how do I want to say it? You know, just physicalities of your past into your present, and it doesn't work. And when we do that, then we start feeling like, what's wrong with me, I'm not, you know, I'm getting old, you know, um, or this, or we start to reject the changes and the advances, you know, that are happening, you know, this technology, and this is too much, and you don't need to do all of this, and that, you know, why we got to have this, and why we got to have that, you know, as opposed to embracing and saying, yeah, you know, there was a point in my life where, you know, I didn't have the experience and the knowledge you know, and I, I took the time to be agile and put puzzles and figure things out together because my life at that time, I had space for that. But this point of the journey in my life, you know, I ask myself, what do I want in my space? <laughs> and if I don't have to be the person who needs to do this, then let me check the resources around me. And it is okay to ask for help and to ask for support and to stand in saying that that was a time in my life when I would have rolled my sleeves up and just dived in because I had, you know, just the, I had the support around me or I was at a different place in life. But now that's not how I want to spend my time. So I'm not going to do that. You touched on two things I want to just focus in on. One is caregiving. Yeah. A lot of caregivers, um, I've, I've become part of a community of caregivers, and I've invited them to 
I used to have a different podcast, but I combined it with this one mm-hmm. because I just don't have the, the bandwidth to do yeah. two podcasts right now. Yeah. And so I wanted one of the one thing that's really, really important mm-hmm. is for caregivers to to hear people addressing mm-hmm. uh, their needs in empathetic ways. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, that's something that's helped me tremendously. Um, I am in a different phase of caregiving now. I'm no longer caring for my husband at home. He is now getting care from professionals 24 Mm seven. And so I'm able to um, have perspective about that part of my life. Um, And so one of the things I recognize that caregivers sometimes do that's not good for them, not healthy for them is rejecting themselves. Yeah, even hating themselves Mm -hmm. because of that comparison, because most caregivers gain weight. Yeah, most caregivers um, just are not socially many times, um, especially with COVID socially, you start to kind of lose some of your social mojo because you're always at home trying to make sure that you're even if you don't necessarily have to be at home, you're at home because of COVID. Yeah, because you can't bring something home to your to your loved one, and right. so right. many caregivers struggle with this. What would you say to the to the black woman who maybe she sees herself as having used to have been a vibrant person, and now she's like hemmed up in the house all the time? What would you say to that woman? You know, Donna, thank you first for sharing that, Um, because as you were talking, I was reflecting back on just my childhood, you know, and and growing up. And the fact of the matter is, we have always been caregivers. We've always been caregivers, you know, especially in the Black community. We've been caregivers to helping to birth babies, you know, new moms, you know, nieces, nephews, cousins, little cousins. You know, we've always done some form of caregiving. And I I think because at this time and place in the culture, you know, there's so much emphasis on it, but we've always had this. We've always taken care of Muddy and Big Mama. You know, we've always taken plates by the house on Sundays, you know, gone over to wash their clothes and clean up and do things and what have you. Again, it's just that society now is different than what it was then, right? Yeah. So I just want to put it in perspective as we move into conversation that, you know, and also what we know, what I know from the past versus now is that we enlisted the community to help us with caregiving. I think that's the one thing that I'll say is that, you know, enlist the community, enlist a community to help you with caregiving. And your community first is at home, right? Now, some people might say, well, what happens if you don't have sisters, brothers, aunts, you know, that happens, right? But they're, those are not your only community, pe- community people. Those, that's not the only way to build community. But when we were growing up as kids, everybody chipped in to do something. That's why growing up, we had to do the dishes because mama was taking care of grandma. <laughs> we have to mop the floor, clean the house. Like people did their part. You know, I don't know if you remember this, if this was in your household, but there were times where, you know, Thursday night was a cleanup night. Because Friday, when people got off work, you went out to eat. Nobody wanted to clean up on Friday's end of the day. Or you get up early Saturday morning and you clean up early Saturday morning, put the music on. You know, somebody's Mm -hmm. cleaning up, somebody's cooking. Or your mom Mm -hmm. is cooking because you need to cook for the next few days. But people pitched in. So I just want to encourage caregivers to not wear this, don't, don't wear the martyrdom of saying, oh, I'm a caregiver now. Let me put this albatross on me and drag the cross around. You know, woe is me as a caregiver, right? I encourage you to say, you know what, I'm going to be coming into the space of caregiving and I need to tap into a community, you know, to really hear what some wisdom from the caregiving communities. So I think that's really important is to build, you know, connections. Also to recognize and something that you said, you're in a different phase of caregiving. There are phases to caregiving. And that's important to build community versed on, you know, based on the phase of caregiving that you're in. So you may have communities at the beginning of the, you know, where you may be able to entertain other caregivers to come over. You know, you mentioned COVID. Maybe we sit on the porch, you're in the South. You know, I'm outside, I'm in California, but maybe you come over, we're on the balcony, we don't come in the house. 
you know, or maybe we have virtual coffee, you know, to just talk about what's going on, you know. Um, I think that's, or we meet at the salon if we can meet at the nail shop and that's our girl time. We get coffee, we get our nails done and hey, I got 90 minutes, go. <laughs> you know, so I think it's important to really leverage the resources that are in the community. Do not get your place yourself in a place where you feel isolated. You're not a victim. You know, you're a participant and the way that you take care of yourself as a caregiver, that also affects the care of the individual that you are caring for. Because they can feel when this is heavy on you or they can feel when they're when you're doing your best. You know, so keep that in mind, get that community together. Um, the other, and recognize the phases that there are phases of caregiving. The other thing I'll say in taking care of yourself is you get to love on yourself in special ways. I think, again, the culture puts it out there that loving on ourselves means that we need to go out of the house. We need to get some drastic stuff done to us in order to have some, some level of self-appreciation and love. And the community and the culture rewards you for those kind of things, right? But I will tell you simple ways that you can be able to really replenish your soul is to spend some time with yourself to really use this time as time to get deeper understanding about, well, God, I'm on this journey and I, I hadn't planned this. So what do you have planned for me? Let, let me hang out with you. <laughs> let me hang out with you so that I can, you know, have a deeper relationship from you because I need to, to learn how to, you know, where is my source, my energy coming from, you know, and learn to give myself some grace in this. So I would say, you know, in those quiet moments, really look at loving yourself. Sometimes that's a bubble bath, Donna. And I am notorious for taking a bubble bath in the middle of the day. Like it ain't nobody, I'll be working. And I will say, you know what? I want to go soak. <laughs> and I will stop. I will run bath water and I will take me a bubble bath, sometimes for two hours. And then I feel so much better when I come out, right? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. that's one thing that you can do is love on yourself. The other thing that I do is I take really good care of my body. I look at what I'm putting into my body. So that has a lot to do, you know, food, food has vibration. Knowledge has vibration. Wisdom is a high vibration. So what you're putting into your body helps you to feel great, feel good, or feel bad. So you've got to look at what you're feeding your body and what you're feeding your mind and what you're putting in your ears, what sounds are coming into you. So that's a way to take care of yourself, you know, on that. Other moments, tea, stealing away, you know, to sit outside, even on the steps. Sometimes I sit out on my steps and I just I just want the sun, the vitamin D to just hit me and just give me some energy and take a deep breath. And sometimes I need to be reminded seeing the birds, you know, even the bugs, you know, God's given us dominion over animals, right? To just be able to give gratitude, you know, for what I have and just to take a few minutes, you know, on that. So those are some things that I would encourage, you know, um, caregivers to do. And a couple of things I'll add to more is read some books that feed your soul. The Bible is a good book that feeds your soul. Read some other books that feed your soul, you know, about things that, that you have burning deep questions about for your own growth, not the popular culture, but your own growth. You know, so those are things that I recommend that caregivers, you know, to do. And for those people that are listening that aren't caregivers or at this stage, or they just maybe their loved ones, you know, have gone on. Oh, if you're not, if you're not a caregiver now, you may you be will one be. day. You will be. I would yeah. say for those of you that are not caregiving now, call caregivers and give them some love. Call caregivers and just tell them that you appreciate them ask them how they're doing. And if they say I'm doing all right, just keep talking because they're going to tell you what's going on with them, how they're feeling. You know, sometimes take them over lunch, send them lunch, send them flowers, send them a gift, send them a card just because, you know, and it makes the difference because sometimes the person they're caring for may not be in a position where they can express that. And the person they're caring for is dealing, you know, with the issue too, that they are not who they used to be. So that's the advice that I would I would give and I give and I hope that helps somebody. One of the great things about what you've shared is that these are things that are so simple yeah. that sometimes people overlook 
just little mm -hmm. simple things like that, little ways to take care of yourself, little ways to, to gain support, to build a community. Um, yeah. If you don't have a community, some people are more isolated because they don't live near their normal family and friends that maybe they used to, to be yeah. around and they may be in a situation where they've relocated and they don't really have that many, but you can build a community. You can create community. You can find community online. I am very blessed to be part of several online support groups. Yeah. Now, in my opinion, that does not support in-person support. Right. It doesn't replace in-person right. support. However, mm -hmm. sometimes that's all, you, that's all you can get access to. Yes. So it's better that than nothing. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. There are other online resources that you can use for your mental health support. When you're a caregiver, you need that mental health support. Mm -hmm. um, many Black women that are married, they know their husbands are not going to go to therapy. They're just not going to do it. But you can. You don't yeah. have to wait for them. You don't you have can. to wait for them. And you know what? The, the, the and you should. <laughs> And you should, you absolutely should. So a lot of what happens is a lot of women will say, well, my husband or my partner won't go. So, you know, and I'm just so frustrated. I'm trying to get them to go. The best way that you can, the best way that you can really encourage people to participate in therapy is when you go, when you go and then you start to shift in your being and how you show up with them, then people will start to look at you like, wait a minute, you used to be snapping, you know, when you would say this, or you used to be annoyed by that. Now I see a sense of calm in you, or they st they start to experience you the, a softer side that is a more uh, compassionate, you know, side of who you are with them and or how you treat yourself. So mm -hmm. don't spend time holding up your growth because you are waiting for other people to give you permission to grow. Give yourself permission to grow and give them permission, you know, so that they can find a way to grow themselves. And they may eventually come around or not, but definitely they are not gonna be the way that they used to be with you because you no longer will be receiving that type of action and energy from them. And our children, watch us. Yeah. Even if your children are adults, they still watch us. Yeah. And they can learn so much just from us taking care of ourselves. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So as we, they watch we, us. We mm -hmm. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. They, they teach, the, we teach them how to be adults by what we do. We teach them adult behaviors from our adult behavior. A lot of children will never admit that they're learning anything from you, <laughs> especially if they're teenagers, preteens or whatever. Mama don't know nothing, okay? <laughs> they know everything. Mama knows nothing. But they watch you and they learn from you, no matter if you think that they are or not. They, they are. They are. They watch. And um, I'm really grateful. Um, that I've been surrounded by a family of women who have got to see them grow. I have, my mother has four sisters and um, it's, it's amazing to, to watch their lives, you know, and I've, I've been so blessed to learn from each of them in different ways from watching their lives. And um, it's important, it's, it, is, it is so important that self-care is not important just for your self-care. Yeah. But it's important so your children can see what it looks like when people change, when people get healthier. Absolutely. So, Venice, I am just so enamored by all of your bling and your boldness and your bold um, model. Yeah. Can you tell us what, what your t-shirt says? Yeah, so my t-shirt, you know, what's interesting is as I was preparing for, um, you know, our conversation today, it came up in my soul and it was like, you know, today I should put your t-shirt on that says bold. And I have several t-shirts, but this one is bold and it says build on the Lord daily. 
is what this one says. And it has two crosses there, and depending on the lighting, if you can see it. Um, and it's in purple, so the bling is in purple, you know, um, and it really just gives me the energy along with the color, the gold color. It, it's just the energy that I wanted to bring to our conversation today. And so it, that's where this is coming from. It takes courage to change. Mm. And that um, building on the Lord daily, that takes courage to not just keep doing the same old, same old, whining, complaining, moaning, groaning, denigrating yourself, um, comparing yourself to who you used to be or what you used to look like. Mm -hmm. um, it takes courage to come out of that. Yes. How can a woman leader who is looking for that, to develop that boldness in her life, what are some steps she can take to develop that boldness? You know, um, I will add on to what you said. It absolutely takes courage to change because the subconscious is, wants us to be comfortable, you know, because it's what we know and it's what we're familiar to. And when we revert to it, we, we know where we're gonna get. But when we are stepping into the unknown, we don't know what's possible or, or what's in the unknown. That's why being bold and building on the Lord daily is important because you, you definitely need the base, a source, you know, that you can be able to pull from to step into the unknown because, you know, we hear it all the time that, you know, there could be something waiting for you on the other side. But what we don't hear is, but to get to the other side, you got to go through some things. <laughs> that might be uncomfortable. And some of those things is what we call change. <laughs> so that's it. So that's important to just kind of gird yourself up, right? You know, with support so that you can just kind of step, 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 you know, into that. And one of the things that I see, because sometimes even though we're talking um, religious, religion, and we're talking spirituality here, is that some women, Black, black women leaders don't feel comfortable bringing that into their work environment. And so what I want to do is to give you a couple of cultural terms, you know, that can, you know, give you pause um, to really, um, really look at what could be showing up for you so that you can start to pivot when this shows up. And a couple of things that are important, we've heard a lot about self-sabotaging, you know, self-sabotaging is when you, uh, when a person feels like they're they're an imposter, you know, self-sabotage. So they will do something to sabotage the success. If they're doing great in it, they'll be like, oh, if they find out, you know, about me, let me just, you know, maybe not be so perfect in it, or they probably won't like it, or they'll start doing actions, you know, that will really negate the success that they've had because they get into what I call sabotage cycles. And sabotage cycles is when you, something great and amazing happens for you. And instead of embracing that and embodying the accomplishment, the achievement, you look for a way to sabotage the success that has just happened for you, right? And I'll give you an example how this could possibly show up in the workplace. So you get this big promotion, um, or unless not even promotion, you get this project. And you're working on this project and you're really putting all your energy into this project and you 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 know you you're like oh i feel so great about it you spend a lot of time overthinking overworking it but it comes out right and so then you go and do the presentation on it and then someone says to you this is great venice you know we really you know enjoy this so um we're looking forward to more you know more opportunities for you to present to us and then, you know, I start saying internally, they don't know that oh, this took so long to do. I don't know if I want to do this again. This took a lot of time and energy and, uh, and it just, I, you know, I couldn't go to the game and, you know, just like, uh, I don't have the energy for that kind of stuff. So, you know, I, I think I'm just going to pass, you know, and then instead of seeing it as an opportunity where you're like, you know what, I probably could have done this a different way. So the next time you know, I will engage people around me that I trust, you know, and I trust their feedback. And maybe I can tell them what my process is, and then they can help me to fine tune the process so I can get better. So we'll talk ourselves out of it 
because we don't want to go because the change is different. Um, people might have an expectation or we're just standing up to the next level of who we are and we are comfortable, you know, being where we at. So when we get into a sabotage cycle, we can't grow and we can't go to the next the next level. So and we sometimes keep and sometimes yeah. we don't want to ask for help. Sometimes because we, don't we think that might make us look weak or like yeah. we're not perfect. I think that you're you that shows you a smart and a strong person because you know that you can't do it alone. Listen, Jesus had disciples. Come on now. <laughs> Send them out two by two. Yeah, exactly. Right. But basically, he had to get a message out. He's like, I can't, he could have, could he have been everywhere at one time? Absolutely. But I don't think that that was the demonstration that he really was promoting. I think he was promoting that I have this gift, but also there are people around me that are equally or gifted in their way and they can take the same message or components of the message and get it out there. And he didn't expect them to do it solo either. He nope. sent them out two by two. Yes. So I think we get to look at that if there's a sabotage cycle where there's an opportunity for you to grow in your work environment and people are coming to you and presenting opportunities to you and then you keep putting yourself in the cycle where you're not stepping up to the next level to do it and you keep sabotaging and then they bring somebody else in to promote someone else. Now you're disappointed because you say they should have seen how hard I was working. Didn't they know? Well, you know, it, what part did you contribute to making sure they know? <laughs> you know, another part of, of uh, success sabotage is, um, I mean, a sabotage cycle is, you know, for women, I'm a, I'm a single, I'm a married woman. And, you know, in my experiences in the past of out there dating, people always say, oh, good men are hard to find. And, you know, all of the things that culture tells us, right? And you meet somebody that, you know, you do a lot of work on yourself. You get yourself, you get yourself in a, a position where you're like, I'm really great to go out and potentially connect and meet that special person. And then you draw into you the negativity you know, from that other person. And then what happens is you, you start feeding into that negativity and you start saying to yourself, you don't make a difference. I went and did all this work, and, you know, this doesn't matter. I still attract the same type of person in my life. It's always drama, this is always drama that. So why do this? Why, you know, why put the energy and the effort into this if this is what keeps happening? So I'm just gonna take what's there. And mm -hmm. it's, it's like you're sabotaging yourself for the growth that you have. Because you're like, I don't want to be by myself, so I'm just not going to say anything. I'm just, I'm just going to go with the flow. Mm -hmm. So, so many times we go with the flow, but it's not our flow. So really check yourself for a sabotage cycles that, you, that you're doing, right? And Another sometimes that, that can happen in terms of, if you translate that same scenario into yeah. a career setting. Yes. Yes. Sometimes yeah. we accept a job because we're just willing to settle for whatever. And yeah. this day and age, the millennials have shown us that we don't have to do that anymore. Yeah, like you, you go into a toxic work environment. You accept, you know, working or continue to work in a toxic work environment when you don't have supportive, you know, the management isn't supportive. You know, when the, when the, the culture within, the, within that environment isn't supportive and you continually complain about the manager, you know, and, and this company won't do this and people here won't do that. And every day you put yourself in that environment and when opportunities come up for you to level up, you, you're just comfortable, you know, in mediocrity. And it's a, it's a vicious cycle that sometimes people get in and don't realize that they are feeding the monster. Sometimes they are perpetuating the sabotage cycle. By not speaking up for yourself, by not asking for someone else to advocate for you, to help you. Yeah. Um, these are things that can kind of come from perfectionism because we don't want to look weak. Yeah. We want to look like we're perfect. Mm. And so we don't ask. We, we don't, don't ask for help. We don't receive help. Sometimes people are offering help and we reject it. Um, those are things that can come from 
having this unrealistic, unrealistic expectation of ourselves. We want to do it all. Yeah, we, we want to be superwoman. Yeah. And, and we want to handle everything on our own. <laughs> right, right. You know, um, I, you know, one of the things that I want to talk about another component, but when you bring up the superwoman aspect of it is I realized that superwoman is not my shero. That, and what I realized is that self-awareness is really my hero. So being self-aware, superwoman, she is not somebody that I want to be. Um, she, there's nothing that she does that encourages me and embodies me to do it the way that she does it. But what I needed to look at is to be my own hero. And, and, and what the, you know, that thing, that aha, that, that power, you know, it comes from that awareness you know, of who I am and what I'm capable of and how I want to be in the world. And when you step into owning the awareness and the truth from the awareness of who you are, that gives you power of choice of how you want to respond to that. And people can, I mean, we could, listen, we could do an all day podcast talking about shoulda, coulda, woulda, but you don't understand. I have these expenses and I have been at this job for years. And, you know, so those again are things that keep us from thinking about the what ifs. What if I were to do A, B, and C so that I could have X, Y, and Z? So it's absolutely possible. Absolutely possible. So, any woman that's wearing a superwoman uh, cape and you feel like you need to do it all and everybody's coming to you to ask you everything and you can't get anything done because you're taking care of everybody else, I would encourage you to ask yourself the question, what could it look like if I allowed other people to take care of themselves? What could that look like for them? And ultimately, what could it look like for me to be able to see them own who they are and step into their fullness, whether that's in work or whether that's in personal family life. Because we do them a disservice. We do them a disservice when we don't do that. We, we keep them going. There's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> I am just, wow, there's a lot to unpack there. And I know we don't have time. And like you said, we could talk about this <laughs> for the rest of the day. We can talk about this um, for the rest of the day. (laughs) So one of the things I want to make sure that we get to is give you the chance to share what you're doing. Do you have any events or any Mm -hmm. uh, launches coming up? What's going on in your world and what do you want our audience to know about? Yeah, I'm I'm just, oh my goodness. You know, when we get together as women and talk, boy, we, we really change the world when we get together and we have conversations like this. So I hope it inspires other women to go a little bit deeper. So what's going on in my world is I am going through a rebrand of my business. So I will be launching a new website, new content, you know, towards the end of this month. And I am on the speaking circuit. <laughs> Your podcast, Donna, being one of them. Um, Next week, I will be speaking um, for UC Berkeley's um, staff conference day. So I will be speaking to, uh, I think it's up to 1,200 attendees from all of the UC systems in the state of California. So I'm excited to talk about how to, um, how to um, have a bold, bold career is what I'm talking about, you know, for them. And then I have another webinar that's coming up where I'm participating. Actually, it's a summit, a four-day summit. It's called Breakthrough Media. So it is helping small business owners to position themselves so that they can get the media attention or leverage media, you know, to be able to grow their business. And I'm also going to be speaking um, later this month, and I think it'll come out next month, um, on UC Berkeley's podcast you know, about um, upskilling is what I'll be talking about there. And then in upskilling, upskilling, yes. Upskilling, okay. We're all in the position of upskilling. It's really taking the skill that you have and going deeper and expanding that skill set because of 
you know, artificial intelligence, you know, where we are and our data analytics, all of these things that are happening with the technology, you know, that's going around us, we, we get to upskill so that we can be able to, you know, continue to command a higher value in the marketplace um, to be competitive in the marketplace. You know, we've always done that. We just didn't have that term to call it that. And I'll just cap this off by in August, I will also be um, kickstarting my international speaking tour, you know, in August, starting off in London. And it's going to take me to Paris and then to Dubai. Wonderful. So that's what's new for me. Wow. Speaking of Dubai, there's a new reality show based out of Dubai. Oh, Lord. Pretty fantastic. <laughs> Pretty fantastic. It's beautiful there. I love the all of the scenery that they show there and everything. Mm -hmm. That's the one reason I'm a, I'm a big reality TV show fan because <laughs> I've learned so much about other places from mm -hmm. watching those shows. Yeah. And um, yeah, very, very interesting. I hope that you have a blast on I your travels. I I've been to Dubai twice. So I was there earlier this year. Oh, okay. um, I was in Egypt first and then Dubai. So th that was my second time in both those countries. So it's definitely getting out to see the world. Uh, um, it, it puts things in perspective. It puts things in perspective. And I encourage Absolutely. anyone who can do that. Um, even if you just get out to see the communities around you, you know, within your state, um, going from different cities, you know, safely, of course. Um, it, it just puts things in perspective when we get out outside of our bubble. What would you say to a Black woman leader who wants to travel but doesn't feel like she can? You know, again, here we go with community. There's so many communities, you know, travel communities that are out there um, that you can join and be a voyeur you know, in their travels. A lot of those communities are safe environments for you to ask questions. I, I've seen different communities for single black women travelers. You know, and they talk about how to be safe, you know, in traveling. I do a lot of traveling by myself. I do go in groups, but I do a lot. And most times the groups are always on the East Coast, but I'm the one coming from the West. So sometimes, you know, we don't always hook up until we get to that place. And even just in different times of arrival, you know, be smart. We're, you're smart. The same way you're smart at home, be smart when you're in other countries. So it's definitely doable. Um, you may start with smaller places that are more comfortable for you. Like Mexico may be more comfortable versus going immediately over to um, Africa, you know, or somewhere in Europe. Um, so I just would encourage you to join communities of other like-minded Black women and put the questions out there. Someone has answers and then start from there. I mean, they go everything, Donna, from planning the trip to how to save for your trip. They even have techniques, you know, that you can be able to put your trips on layaway. So if there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> Full disclosure, I'm part of a couple of those communities um, because I aspired to travel when I was young. I mm -hmm. lived in England for eight weeks, changed my world, Ooh. changed my whole perspective on myself, on life, on the world, on America. Yeah. Um, and I feel that this is something that's extremely important for everybody. Yes because the world is changing. It's becoming more globalized. Everybody, every, all these companies, they're now wanting to send people to other countries to you know, handle whatever job or expertise that they need there. And those of us who aren't willing to travel are being left behind. And so, I mean, it's already happening. It's already, it's already a thing. And a lot of people just get angry about it and complain and I want everything to be made in America, et cetera. But no, it's, it's never gonna be that way again. Now with COVID things had to kind of be pulled back a little bit, but um, everything's still just moving forward. Even if it is online, it's still international, right? Yeah, it's still international. There are people working, there are people working in other countries but they have to work on East Coast time, right? There are people working in America that are working for multinational companies and they have to be able to get up at five o'clock in the morning or 
or whatever. So that takes boldness, that takes courage, that takes a lot. That can't happen when you're just stuck in this mindset of, I gotta be perfect all the time. Yeah. You'll never be able to grow. That's not a growth mindset. Being so totally focused on just doing everything perfect and doing everything the same way so that it can appear to be perfect. Because that's how a lot of people get stuck is they're so afraid to make a mistake that they want everything to stay the same so that they can kind of, you know, like be the, be the big fish in the little pond or whatever. But, you know, honest truth, as a Christian, um, from a Christian perspective, that's not, that God doesn't call us to just play small like that yeah. all the time. You, you may think it's playing big, being the big fish in the little pond, but it's really playing small. Yeah. And I, I will add to that, that even in the Bible, when we look at the stories of, of different um, uh, characters in the Bible, we see them struggling also with everyday life. I mean, have, being blessed by God and still lying to people and, <laughs> you know, and, and not keeping, you know, making a promise to God that you would do something and then hoarding you know, or, or, you know, so we're all human, you know, we're all human. And I love that, you know, that you said that, you know, you really do just have to continue to let that go, work on letting that go and realize that nobody's perfect, you know, in that. And it's, it's a lot of energy to main, to try and maintain being perfect because you can never get it right. You can never get it perfect. So there's a lot of energy that you, take away from other things in your life, you know, trying to focus on perfectionism. So it's just not a good look and it, and it will physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, it will just make you sick. And, and, you know, it's not attainable to be perfect. is not even attainable. And so then you have these people talking about, Oh, we'll just fake it till you make it. And that's a whole other thing, you know, people, women, in my opinion, most women can't sustain that, that fakeness for long. It's not sustainable. And it's, and it's unhealthy. Like you were saying, it's unhealthy. So in parting, what would you say to a black woman leader who She's determined to be bold, but she's coming up against obstacles. What's the one thing that you would say to her to help her break out and be that bold, courageous person that she wants to be? Hmm. The one thing that I would tell a Black woman leader, you know, in terms of breaking, stepping into her boldness is to first do really a self audit, you know, for every area of your life, right? And in that audit, tell yourself the truth. Tell yourself the truth. And then look for the evidence in your life to really confirm the truth that you're telling yourself, you know? And what I mean by that is, if you do an audit in your life and you're like, you know, I'm not happy in my career, you know, I, I just see just, I'm exhausted when I wake up, when I get there, I feel drained before I even start my day. Or you may be having experiences of, I don't feel appreciated or valued, you know, for the, the talent that I have. When you're auditing that and telling yourself the truth, look at the demonstration of what that truth is for you. So if you, if you say you're feeling that, and then you go into you know, a meeting with someone. And if you're, if the experience is pushback, if the experience is people are saying they don't value, this isn't good enough, we want it X, Y, and Z, can you do A, B, and C? Then tell the truth to yourself that that's what they want and it has nothing to do with you. Tell yourself the truth about that, that experience. Because a lot of times we will embody somebody else's truth as our own truth. So you need to be able to distinguish between what is true for somebody else and what's true for you. And another part of telling yourself the truth is when it's time to move on from that career, you know, tell yourself the truth 
this has been a great ride, but things have changed so much. It's time for me to move on from this. And then ask yourself the open-ended question. What could it look like if I moved on to do A, B, and C? What could it look like if I moved on and took a break before? And if you in the answers you give yourself, if an answer could be, well, you know, it would look like me taking a break. I just need to, oh, I need to have a month off. Okay. So if that is the truth that you tell yourself of what it, what, you know, the possibility could be, right? A new truth you want to create, then so what would I need to do to start positioning myself to make this a reality for me? Oh, I need to look at my finances. You know, I need to come up with some type of financial plan. Oh, I need to, you know, invest and get my resume updated, you know, or work with a career coach, you know, to help me to see what's possible for me next in the career, in a career. So it starts opening up th those questions, the truth, the assessment, telling yourself the truth, and then looking for evidence, you know, for supporting the truth that you found out that you're owning about yourself and then asking the open-ended question for next steps and keep following the breadcrumbs, keep following them. But before you step into your boldness, you, have, you get to audit and you get to tell the truth. Otherwise, and it needs to be your truth, not what these people are doing. It needs to be the truth for you. Mm -hmm. Then that will, set you, that will start to set you on a journey for stepping into your, evolving into your boldness. Absolutely, great advice. One of, the, one of the great things that I love about um, being part of communities mm -hmm. is that they can, being a part of a community of like-minded people can help you gain that kind of perspective. Yes. And so coming out of isolation, coming out of trying to do everything on your own all the time, mm -hmm. um, that's something that can really help you in that process. And I wanna to speak to the audience now, make sure that you remember to listen to the end because you're gonna hear about what we're doing to offer mentorship through the community that I'm a part of. And um, this is something that mentorship has been so critical in my life mm -hmm. at every stage of my life, not just when I was a, a young person, but even as an adult, um, having somebody that you can um, not just lean on for asking them to do stuff for you, but just to listen, just to listen, to get book recommendations, to whatever, um, whatever you need so that you can keep learning. And that's what you gotta do. You gotta keep learning. And Ms. Venice Johnson has just laid a lot of wisdom and, uh, and knowledge out there for you all to learn from. And I hope that you all will connect with her. Venice, tell us your website address. So my website address is uh, theboldnesscoach.com. So theboldnesscoach.com. And I actually have a free guide. I have a free guide, a free self-care uh, guide that um, listeners can download. So it's right on the page when you land. So please, please, you know, you can partake that. You can also find me on Instagram at the boldness coach. You can find me there. And I also am on Facebook, of course, under Venice Johnson, my name. And I would encourage the women to join the Bold Big Bad Sisterhood on Facebook. So that is a community that I just recently created on Facebook. And so we're in the process of creating, you know, great content, but you can already jump in and see some of the content that's already been created. Um, got a few little simple questions to ask, and then you'll be approved to be into the sisterhood. And so I think that's another great way to be connected to me as well. Fantastic. See, there's an opportunity for you to join Vanessa's community, the big, the bold, big, bad sisterhood. I'm putting in my, <laughs> my request to join right now. And I know that um, this, our time is wrapping up. Is there any final word that you wanted to say before we go? Yeah, I do wanna just kind of close it out by saying, you know, bold, big, bad. You see the words behind me, but my mantra is, you know, I mentioned before about living bold, big, bad. Bold is about being your authentic self. Every day is an opportunity for you to be authentically you. Whatever that authenticity about you is, 
bring that into everything that you do in every way of your life. It just will be so, uh, such a relief to just be yourself. Big is about building in your genius. We were all given at least one talent, at least one. And you can look at the parable of the talents, you know, in the Bible. Um, but that one talent opens up so many opportunities for us in our lives. So identify what your talent is and build in that genius. And the way you build is ask yourself, what else can I do with it? What else can I do with it? What else can I do with it? It will create so many possibilities for you, you know, building off the authenticity into your gift. And then bad stands for blessed and deserving is that you, we were born into a life already blessed. And, you know, owning who you are and building in that will put you in the space to recognize and receive what the deserving of your life that's already waiting to just be a part of who you are. So live life bold, big, and bad with no permission needed. Awesome, awesome. It's been such an honor. Thank you so much. I praise God that he allowed us to connect in this way and allowed me to um, glean off the wisdom that, that he's putting out in the world through you too. Thank you for allowing him to use you for this audience and for all the audiences that he's introducing you to globally all over the world. And I'm so excited for you. And I look forward to um, following your journey. And are you on YouTube too? Yeah, so we're we're revising the YouTube channel. We, we it is on there, but it's not published. Okay. Yeah. So there's a YouTube channel. Well, yes. Well, well, I will be looking out for your updates for your new website, new new channel, and all of that. And again, look for Venice's website over at say it one more time. Theboldnesscoach.com. Theboldnesscoach.com. And Venice is spelled if any of you can't. I don't know if we have any listeners that can't see the screen, but needs to spell V like victory, A-N-E-E-S-E, -E -E, Johnson, Denise Johnson. It's a pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much. And I hope that we get to see each other in person one day. I would absolutely love to meet you. I'm a hugger. I would yes, love to me meet too. you in person one day. Me too. All right. Take care now. Bye-bye.